G'day, guys. Welcome to this week's Hash It Out. Uh, joining once again, we have Joe and Noah. How are we, gentlemen? Doing good. Doing well. Pleasure to have you back on the show once again. Um, just uh, we're watching this in real time, actually, and it's a bit of the market dump and um, the fallout from FTT. And uh, at the moment, it's dropped twenty five percent. Just a standard week in crypto, I guess you could call it. <laughs> this this in the bear market, but there's been a lot of speculation and chatter and um, everything. Uh, people sort of jumping to conclusions and things like that without actually knowing the whole scenario on like crypto Twitter, for instance. Um, so let's hash this out. Let's sort of discuss what's going on currently and uh, sort of uh, go once again and, and touch on people's assumptions, what people should be asking in the industry and things like that. Sure. It's a shit show. Let's start there. <laughs> yeah. Well, in a nutshell, yeah. It's a funny thing. Uh, nobody really knows exactly what's going on because there's no transparency, which is exactly what we talked about last week. But um can make some guesses based on uh, tweets and things like that. Um, so the situation from what I can tell is that last week, I think, there was like a leaked balance sheet from Alameda, which is the company that, uh, or a company that Sam Bankman-Fried owns. It's like his investment arm. And then FTX is his exchange arm. <clears throat> and the balance sheet for Alameda was basically like, way more of it was FTT token than people expected it to be. So, you know, their books were basically like there was this uh token printed out of thin air that was propping up their their balance sheet people got really nervous about that and um binance made a statement that they would be li liquidating all of the ftt on their balance sheet and now it's a war <laughs> a war between cz and sbf uh and we're, we're watching it go down in real time I mean, I guess retail is getting what slaughtered in the middle. That's Probably. the sad case, unfortunately. And we say this once, like time and time again, numerous times on every show that we've been sort of recording for the last, I don't know, what are we up to? Maybe 20 shows or something. Um, we're always touching on sort of know your assumptions and um, look into open source frameworks and transparency and everything like that. Know what you're getting into because ultimately um these big sort of companies the exchanges etc do have a lot of things on their balance sheet of their private companies they don't have to disclose that but ultimately it is a black box and um once the truth comes out uh it's there's some pretty dodgy things going on behind the scenes not only on in this scenario but it's happened previous like with the previous dump for instance in this bear market so um yeah once again we're in this scenario and sort of watching it um, in real time well, I think let's start from like a basic approach, right? One thing that people focus way too much on, in my opinion, uh, in this space is this concept of market cap, right? And and that's fundamental to understand the situation here because you have a token that's, uh, you know, somewhat distributed, let's say that, somewhat. Um <laughs> And so then you have to ask, okay, so you have massive amounts of this token that are essentially being held off the market, right? Which creates artificial scarcity. And then you have some of this token that is liquid on markets, uh, but we have no idea uh, what is the active volume by market makers. I mean, that is one thing that uh, Alameda does, right? It is a trading arm. So you have to say, okay, so if market cap is pretty much a shit metric and volume itself really probably does not reflect organic demand because you have market making. And I imagine, um, you know, especially on, well, one hand trading on the other hand's exchange, I bet they have pretty good market making rates. I'm just going to throw that out there, right? And I don't think that's a um leap right yep so then you have to say okay so we don't even know like the actual organic liquidity of this asset 
But uh, somehow a company has said, okay, well, this is the market cap, even though that's a shit metric. And uh, then has built their balance sheet using that as collateral. And that's dangerous. Like, there's no other way to put that. That seems really sketchy to me. Yeah, in the traditional yeah. finance world, uh, it would be definitely be frowned upon, <clears throat> that's for sure. Um, it's it's a You did touch on market cap and trading volume, and it's one thing that I've sort of gone at length trying to explain to people in the industry about um, how artificial that can be. Uh, obviously, or for people who don't know, Ergo has a sort of uh, pretty minimalistic sort of approach to market making, and I think the volume reflects that. It's You can see basically what's happening there is organic, um, organic trades yep. throughout the day. Uh, what happens is you can see even from a market cap perspective of a coin, let's say at a, at a ranking of say 500 or so with a market cap of only even sort of $10 million, but has a a daily volume of say 50 million or, or greater like it who knows what sort of happening is happening behind the scenes the trading rates you could have uh just a couple um a li- or liquid tokens that are just getting thrown back and forth to one another and just inflating that the volume metric so um yeah it's when people sort of discuss all that sort of side of it they don't actually know or aren't aware of sort of what happens behind the scenes on, on many tokens and, and coins throughout the industry. Yeah, I, I have the information that, you know, because I'm the one that, you know, has to meet exchange requirements and roughly about 2% of Ergo's volume is through our market maker. Which is two per- <laughs> crazy. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> yeah, but I don't mind just, I don't mind disclosing that. I think it should be something that, you know, People should know if they ask, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and why do we do that? Because we have to. Yeah. You know, two so, percent so really of sense. say roughly a million dollars a day. Um, it's not much in the whole scheme of things. No, but that's why if you look at the um, overall volume relative to rank, we're like this weird yeah. project. Uh, you know, everyone's always what, like. We need more volume. Why is the volume so low? And it's like, well, yeah, you know, and, and and it is true that if you have if you have um, demand and as the ecosystem grows and as market access expands, you will have more organic demand and and ergo will become more liquid. Now, the beauty of not hacking that process, which you know, when you have something that you know, a token with not that many users, but somehow they have millions and millions of dollars of, of liquidity. That's just usually one actor. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's, okay, they do have to put liquidity on both sides of the books, but, uh, you know, you have to ask, you know, are they range trading to their advantage and is that profitable? Probably. We don't trade against the community. That's not our goal. Yeah, it's one thing that's every all has always been, uh, or so, for as long as I've been in the ecosystem, anyway, the ecosystem that's um, been the messaging there. It's uh, not trading against our user base. Um, it's been pretty open and transparent about that, and I think the numbers reflect it. Uh, so, yep. uh, basically, on the FTT side of things, um, yeah, it's. This is all allegations, obviously. No one sort of knows what's happening um, firsthand. You can see some stuff that's happening on chain. I think the markets are kind of reflecting all that speculative side of it at the moment. But um, if one arm is then trading to prop up that collateral and and pump up the actual um, valuation of, say, company A, and then pump company B then is sort of trading that against each other, like it's it's uh, it's yeah, completely sketchy in in my books. Well, it's, it's happening in a way that's not transparent, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the reality is when you get into um, high-level trading, right, there is value to be made in liquidating your opponent and cleaning up, right? Mm-hmm. So where sometimes especially, people, when, especially when there's politics involved. Yeah, it's, sometimes people are not trading how the average user thinks like, okay, I'm going to buy at one price and then sell at a higher price and, and keep the difference. Yeah. Sometimes it's, I'm going to sell into somebody's position, liquidate them and then clean up at a lower pl- price, right? Like there's a lot of, um, oh, basically it's, it's kind of a shark eat shark. 
pond out there. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think we're seeing this between two major entities in the space, which is insane, but <laughs> now that we can crypt all you can do is laugh. It's yeah. It's I mean, there's, there's been some great movies out there. I'll, I'll give it. I'll give that to the <laughs> basic. Yeah, I've seen Demi a couple of rippers. So, yeah, thanks for everyone for putting those together because there's some fantastic ones out there. So yeah, thanks everyone for jumping on that. And um, the internet never fails to sort of surprise me either with uh, the creativity. That's fantastic. The uh, the really interesting thing. You know, I don't give, I don't give a fuck about the price of FTT, but the uh, there will, you know, if this thing really shits the bed, it'll have Big ripple concept. effects really, yeah, it'll really have, badly. It'll have consequences. Yeah. You know, it would be nice if exchanges had transparency, right? That would be that would be like the number one thing I would say that would assist in this. Uh, scenario because then people would at least know right but so often you know because there's no transparency and even though they're interacting with chains nothing's actually on chain it's in an exchange wallet mm -hmm. um we can't see what's happening right and so then you have to say okay well who can see what's happening and what do they know right because then you have people that you know are making choices uh, without the information to even make assumptions in terms of what is actually happening. And uh, sometimes, you know, it builds into a narrative of its own. And the bottom line is that it, when you look at trading, it's it's kind of a zero-sum game, right? You have a buyer and a seller and a seller and a buyer. And, and, you know, there's a lot of carnage in the middle, right? And when you have something that's super hypey, right, it's trending, um, you know, you have people that uh, jump into the water with no assumptions, no information, and just get wrecked. So be careful out there, everybody. Yeah, you see the uh, story, you hear stories, you read stories um, throughout sort of crypto Twitter, even through Reddit and things like that, scenarios where people have got lucky and they've 100 x to 8 in at the right time and or potentially made millions of dollars and things like that. But uh, on the flip side of that, markets being markets, you have to have a buyer, you have to have a seller. Um, someone just yeah. lost a hundred million, so or whatever million dollars or whatever it is. So yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, or, it is. It is pretty wild. You know, like in this show, um, you know, I've tried to speak relatively freely in terms of transparency. Right. This is a moment why that matters. Like yeah. nobody knows. Right. And, and somehow uh, we find ourselves in the place yet again where it's like there's smoke, but nobody can actually see inside of anything to know if there's a fire. Yeah. And then you know, then things take on a life of their own. Right. Like how crazy how crazy would it be if, uh, you know, the majority of the run on FTX and the majority of kind of the carnage that's happened so far wasn't even an issue. It was a rumor. Right. We're like, yeah. we don't know because we can't see. Um, yeah. I, I do think that in a, in a situation like this, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Right. And, and I would love to see uh, an exchange that had transparency. Right. Because that had, because the bottom line is they can aggregate that data in house. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not as though that data doesn't exist and isn't being, collected and looked at I, I think that if i ran an exchange it'd be stupid not to do that to understand the flows in my own business i mean that's not a great leap of logic i think mm -hmm. <laughs> but why, why, why yeah but it's you know it's proprietary yeah. and that is that is a trading advantage like that i think that you know the average retail user needs to go onto an exchange if they're going to trade and be like well you know you are in a situation with huge information asymmetry you know so be careful yeah the crazy thing too is like you were saying <clears throat> it maybe it's not true maybe that could maybe be it's just a rumor wouldn't that uh, be if, if but, we see like millions of dollars of losses because nobody knows 
Yeah, and even if it isn't true, uh, Maybe let's we say may. they let's say <laughs> they do have FTT as collateral all over the place. You mm -hmm. know, it'll still have ripple effects everywhere. Yeah. It'll still fuck retail investors and. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of crazy. Um, Mind you, like um, just media reports and things like that as well. Like, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that the mainstream media is probably willing to jump over anything that's happening in the industry. And if um, you see the volatility of a token moving, say, thirty percent in a number of hours, uh, they'll be jumping all over that. Especially one of the major players um, in the industry. Has a lot of publicity, a lot of sponsorship deals. So the name is out there. Everyone sort of knows FTX. I'd say um, anyone who watches any kinds of sport throughout the world is plastered everywhere currently. So um, yeah, it's it's an interesting sort of um, scenario we're in. A uh, question I have yep. is actually um, around exchanges and the tokens that they actually hold, or is there a need for them to actually hold a token because? In the whole scheme of things, you're basically trading or you, you're you trying to prioritize your own product against the rest of the industry who's or other um, other trading pairs that you have on the book. So it's an interesting concept there alone. Um, and obviously knowing the assumptions and aggregating data and the proprietary data that's known there and basically trying to even suppress um, token A to try and um, raise the the um what's what i'm uh, the profile of your own token yeah you know some of them are kind of like uh structured like a, some kind of membership scheme where you get trading discounts and I, I guess to some degree maybe that has a benefit i mean i know that like traditionally it was just like account volume based where it was tiered and then depending on how active you were you know, you got some fee reduction, um, you know, that, is uh, make a take a fee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're trading like that's kind of been a, a thing for a while to try to incentivize people to be on exchanges and, and be active. Um, you know, it's it's hard to say. I, I I tend to think that being that it's a private company that you can't see inside and you know the actual data there is just opaque um i would question really how decentralized is this like there's a, a single issuer um you know there's a lot of problems there that i would stay away from now i'm a terrible trader like full disclosure um i don't even i don't even trade really i just kind of you know i have some crypto and it's sitting around like uh because it's in my custody right yeah um so you know you can like as, in terms of like advice i'm not qualified you have to you know, do your own research uh you know you have to really learn these things now me i i'm immediately sketched out by that personally because i can't see like i'm going into a, a risk assumption blind and and to me that this isn't how I operate. Is uh is FTT an ERC twenty? Like I don't even know what this token is or I have no idea. <laughs> Never heard of it until this week. Yeah. I've never looked into it to be honest. I've got an OX address, out. so some sort of an EBM sort of side of things. I'm not too sure to be yeah. honest. I don't know. It strikes me as more of a a stock than uh well, it it's 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 a bit weird right yeah because you know exchange tokens uh i don't know they're just issued by a central entity do they have a purpose sometimes do they have an economic use case sometimes you know but uh, in terms of like a software license it's a bit weird yeah one, one thing you did touch on and um i think it's something uh, that we always talk about once again, it's um, custody. Uh, 
there's seen a number of sort of reports going around also that people can't uh, withdraw off FTX currently and there's been some delays and um, people have been reporting that they haven't had an issue, but then there's numerous on the other side that's saying they are having issues trying to get some crypto off. But um, obviously having crypto in your own custody, in your, um, in your own wallet, having your own keys, uh, that's what it's all about in the business. So uh, it's, I'm a huge ag- advocate for having all your crypto off an exchange because who knows what will happen. Um, as long as it's in your custody, you have control of it, you can send it to and from no matter what. But um, if things get locked up on an exchange, it's, uh, or as we've seen in, say, Celsius cases and other, others in the uh, recent his- sort of history, um, yeah, it's just a, a free-for-all and things are locked away and um, you can just sort of wave it goodbye. Well, so you you basically have an asset where the bearer of the asset that can sign for the asset is the person in charge of the asset. And uh, when you're talking about an exchange wallet, you don't have the keys. Yeah. You can't sign that. They can. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a huge risk is, assumption that you need to make. Um, you know, that's not to say you uh, can't trade on exchanges, but... You know, certainly a situation, you know, whether whether it's, you know, we can look at the extreme in terms of history, like Mount Gox just blows up or something like that. You don't have keys. Yep. Like you're not, that's not your asset in that case. No, you, you, know, you can say, okay, I have a claim to it and you can file a lawsuit. And here we are, how many years after Mount Gox uh, went down and, you know, have people been paid out yet? I don't know. Yeah, there's still chatter about There's always rumors it. about that, yeah. I don't know, I Who just took in that case. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a prime example. Um, obviously, people had a number of Bitcoin on Mt. Gox and all other crypto, for instance, but Bitcoin being the major player, and as soon as that went under, uh, people say that I've lost all my Bitcoin or, or Mt. Gox owe me this Bitcoin, but ultimately, you're not in control of it. Like, it's... Uh, one of the things that we, well, I know we talk about it sort of week to week, um, being in control of your own destiny, and that's uh, having keys in your own wallet. Yeah, I mean, we saw Celsius and Voyager this year as well. It's like, yeah. it just keeps happening. Yeah. Well, I keep saying the same thing, black box. That when you yeah. see that, red flags need to come up. Like, yeah. you know, the, the beauty of DeFi the beauty of decentralized exchanges is you can see and you have keys. That's one thing we uh, dis- discussed at length last week, actually. Um, obviously, the DeFi sort of side of it and uh, the fundamentals and uh, basically DeFi moving forward and what we should sort of expect you know, from the DeFi sort of front, of th- uh, DeFi front. Um, and it is that transparency, having control, knowing sort of your assumptions, knowing what you're getting into, because time and time again, we see uh, the best performers are the ones who have that transparency. Everything's on chain. You can jump in there. You can see um, basically the exchange of um, crypto through, uh, through different players, the, the wallets, holdings, et cetera, et cetera. But if yeah, once again, we're in this scenario where we're talking about black boxes and, and open DeFi platforms. So um hopefully we're resonating with someone in the um the ecosystem who watches these videos yeah the goal in my opinion is to be able to have real-time auditability yeah right so we're in this scenario there's smoke right you can just look (laughs) is there a fire where is the fire and you would know yeah maybe there would still be some drama if there was a fire or was an issue but at least we would know, yeah. right? But now you have a select group that does know what's going on. Yeah. They're active. And then you have a much, much, much larger group that you know has no ability to even quantify their risk assumptions that are making choices. Yeah, That seems dangerous to me. Yeah, so kind of on a, a bit lost for words to be honest just in regards to the whole situation and um being in this scenario once again that's just pretty crazy yeah i think it'll be interesting to see uh 
if it does really blow up, what happens on regulation side of things? Yeah. It'll be really interesting because SBF was is pretty pro regulation, but he's going to be the one that uh, regulation is reacting to. So. I'm sure that whenever anything bad happens in this industry, there's always parties that say, hey, everyone, look at the dirtiest laundry. Mm -hmm. Like they pick the worst scenario, um, you know, and, and, and parade that around publicly and it changes sentiment. And then suddenly we're these, you know, bad guys playing with funny money on the Internet that are all security. <laughs> da, 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 da. And the reality is, um, like if you look at it from a principled approach, transparency is the solution here. Like that, that's the problem that we have entities that are interacting with blockchains that nothing is on chain that you can see, observe, follow, and understand. I think that's how statement. you, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was about to change the subject. So go ahead. I was just going to say that sort of ties in with, um, the little tweet storm that you sent out a number of hours ago with all those sort of uh once again the the kya sort of the know your assumption side of things and um yeah it's like uh we're sitting here flogging that dead horse but um hopefully sort of we're getting that message across and ultimately we, we do this stuff to try and get people to ask these right like ask the right questions yeah because ultimately if people ask the right questions we will build better systems that's why I beat that same drum all day, even though it's it's not sexy, it gets boring. But then this happens and it's like, oh, here we are again. It's oh, my here favorite we are song. Again. <laughs> yeah, you like you know, that's that's too much this year that um, yeah. we've run into this situation and every time uh, you know, you just have mass retail carnage. Like first principles matter for a reason. Because ultimately, if you want to have a system that's, I don't know, transparent in terms of assumptions, you need transparency. I don't know. Yeah, so complex. Something, something I've been thinking about in the last week, um, transparency versus privacy. Sure. You know, how, how do you reconcile those two uh, where you have a system with transparency how do i how do i think about it when, well, when you sure yeah i guess okay so when you have something that i would call public infrastructure right when you have logic on chain when you have um things that are serving as a public good or public utility you mm -hmm. need transparency right because that protects the public now if you're talking about private that's where privacy comes into play like I would love to see, um, and I'll just use an example of like, uh, you know, on-chain DeFi, right? You, you kind of have that setup where you can see into the system, the code is open ideally. Uh, you can see all of the positions, you can see the collateral risks, you can see the holdings of the different people that are interacting with their position. But you as a user can come in and, and freely use it without anybody's permission or anybody's, uh, let's say, barrier of entry in terms of your identity, who you are, where you're from, right? Because that's a private actor. But when you have kind of the public infrastructure, um, that needs to be transparent. Knowing all the algorithms, how everything performs and interacts behind the scenes, um, where your your assumptions come from you know how the, these platforms interact and how you can interact with them you know the positions that are happening behind the scenes you know the for instance like on a collateral payout you know the apy um but then as an individual user there's no need for anyone else to know who you are or, or yeah. exactly so um that's the difference i guess um being the transparent end or end or private for uh the individual user itself and the reality yeah. is there's still risks. There's still risks. But, you know, if you look at open source code, which is another drum that I'm constantly banging on, it's because over time, even if you have a system that uh, has transparency and it fails, you have, number one, the ability to, you know, get a really good postmortem and build something better, right? And even if it takes a couple of iterations, 
um, what you end up with is hardened systems yeah. that operate as they should. Like um, that to me is is kind of the ideal. Like there are things in this uh, industry that um, I don't know. They they were built kind of uh, well, but they had an issue, right? Then there were other things that were built right, but the actual utility or uh, a mission or you know framework itself didn't really make sense and and hopefully over time you know with the iteration we just get hardened systems and and at that point um you know i think you have something that then has the ability to really be resilient stand the test of time and deliver a tremendous amount of value you know so i can't say that even if something is open source there's no risk it's just that very well may be a step in the right direction. And, you know, if people know that going into it, then it's like, okay, well, that's a risk assumption you need to make. Because really, yeah. there's, there's one thing that uh, shows strength and design, and that is time. You can't cheat that. And, uh, you know, even if there are risks, at least you know what the risks may be. Mm -hmm. Whereas... Yeah. Uh, you know what we're seeing today nobody really knows nothing. nobody knows there, there will always be risks in DeFi, but at least you can see what the risks may be yeah you know, you know the it, rules it, to the game you can see everything that's happening yeah. you can see all the plays that are being made in real time and um ultimately in this situation that we're sort of seeing unfold currently it's just a matter of we're just seeing the fallout or the aftermath of sort of what's happening but what's happening behind the scenes who knows? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the reality is, what if there's a smoke, no fire, but since nobody can check the fire, there's a stampede and people are just getting trampled senselessly for no reason, right? That That is a potential. I, I can't say that's the case or not the case because I can't see if there's a damn fire, but, yeah. you know, th that would be pretty wild if you think about it. Yeah, it kind of ties in there, I don't know. This keeps popping into my head when these sort of situations keep unfolding. It's um, uh, the Doe Kwon quote. It's like steady lads deploying, deploying more capital. And it's like, I'm just waiting for that sort of comment to come out in this situation um, from or from either side. You know, who knows what's going on behind the scenes. But um, it's from that perspective, for having someone who knows what's happening behind the scenes to then say that, which then can encourage more users to come in and and basically try and uh, provide more liquidity, and then they just get get wrecked up once again. And um, we saw that. I think I can't remember what price it was at. It was in it was that in a whole dollar, I think, at that stage when he said that he was actually going to deploy more um, uh, more funds or whatever it was, more Bitcoin, you name it. Um, but yeah, ultimately we saw the the decimal point and the huge string of zeros at the um, after that. So uh, the the fallout was pretty crazy. Yeah, and I have to imagine if FTT were to enter like a true death spiral, I wouldn't put it past Alameda to short their own token just to <laughs> you know just to make some some exit plays on whatever they can extract out of it. Well, we certainly really... saw that with Celsius, right? Yeah. They had they had insider information that nobody else could see, and just prior to them being bankrupt, you know, they were all hitting the exit. Yep, uh -huh. like that that as that asymmetry um, is ideally something that I think DeFi can eliminate. Like yeah. I think if you build with with first principles, you can eliminate that. Um, and it's not, I don't know, everybody's trying to look for a trade advantage or an information advantage, right? Like I'll use, I'll use the example of SIGUSD. We have this concept of a uh, smoothed oracle, right? Where it only moves within a certain range and it's, it's predictable in terms of when it's going to update and, and how that's going to work. And there have been some people that are uh, pretty aggressive about that concept, right? They're like, oh, it's not a true Oracle. But when you have exchanges that you can't see into that are trading in this industry, and you, know, you could even look at Wall Street, some firms will pay millions of dollars for a millisecond trade advantage because yeah. they have information first 
like, is there such a thing as a true Oracle? Um, you know, and, and if there is, how do you uh, capture that? I, I, I think that in a way it's somewhat of an illusion. So it, it's better to have a transparent system that everybody kind of understands, okay, how it works, how it updates, because then you have basically a level playing field. Yeah, it's almost like the the mining difficulty algorithm that mm -hmm. it takes the average of however many previous epochs and um, it, it results in the algorithm not being able to be gamed quite as easily or at all. But at least uh, it's transparent, right? Yeah. At least it's transparent and people can understand how it works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and to some degree, I think that's better than having uh kind of the system that ethereum had where they you know it updated every block but then there was ways to manipulate that that went on probably for years that nobody even knew about mm -hmm. um, and that was what we saw with uh the bear well right you yeah, know yeah. that was that was prior to the smoothing was it yeah, not? yeah. 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 So they were, yeah they were manipulating the prices on exchanges using that to profit on SIG USD before the Oracle yeah, would update. Yeah, it was an attack vector, uh, Oracle yeah. manipulation uh, in DeFi. And so then we said, okay, what do we do? Let's try to make it fair. Yeah, but that you know, ties into what you said earlier. Um, you've got the open, transparent situation there. There was an attack vector. Someone did find somewhere like a crack throughout the system, but then obviously it hardens the systems long-term because... Uh, you have many eyes looking over the system, the system's being utilized, but ultimately um, over time as a whole, the system's hardened. Yeah, that's the goal. Uh, you know, the reality is, uh, in my opinion, if you look at like the um, long-term goal that I would have for DeFi is that it's going to be iterative. It'll get better. And it'll get more transparent and you know we will hit points where you just have long-term resiliency stability and, and delivers a lot of value it's a useful tool yeah. um, you know exchanges unfortunately are some sort of weird bridge between you know the real world and crypto land right and and so things do get i don't know messy in that in that area yeah, that's uh, it's a strange situation. Um, obviously, you've got the exchanges there. Ultimately, you need an exchange, whether that's a centralized exchange or a uh, decentralized exchange, uh, to actually trade your goods. Um, but then, yeah, one's open, one's transparent, the other's a bit of a black box. But people always gravitate to that black box for some reason, and it's uh, I don't know if it's still sort of. Um, bit of a sort of legacy from traditional finance systems where they're used to having these big players uh, just from a trust perspective. Um, I'm not too sure if that plays into it also. Uh, personally, I would love to think or imagine that uh, at some point, you know, the on-chain value starts to capture real world use and value, and then it's not as needed, right? But most people, okay, there are Bitcoiners out there. I think Bitcoin is probably the only ecosystem that's really um, been around long enough and has, has developed enough that there are people that really do think in terms of stats, right? How much, how many Satoshis am I moving? And, you know, they're, they're not fiat minded, yeah. right? I respect, mm -hmm. that. I respect that. But the reality is the majority of retail are thinking in dollars or euros or, yeah. you know, whatever their common currency they're bringing to the table is, and they're just using crypto as a means to speculate to gain that fiat yeah just you extract know and, and, value. yeah and, and yeah make money and then cash it out into you know kind of whatever i don't know fiat they use and improve their life a little bit and that's okay but long term i would love to see um you know if, if people start thinking in nanoergs and they have the ability to spend or go you know for a variety of things because then it becomes more of a currency. It becomes like the actual, uh, I don't know, base uh, energy. It's a paradigm, sh paradigm shift. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the old uh, meme out there. 
um it's been around in the bitcoin community for a long time and it's like you know neo you know one day you might not have to sell your bitcoin right yeah. like I, I think it'd be really great if we had um you know let's say the tools on chain to make that a reality to where at that point they just become obsolete i have a question for you joe um yeah. When is Erg going to get listed on FTX? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've talked to FTX. Like, well, uh, my, my actual question is, as, uh, as someone who works with exchanges, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that you can't reveal everything, but sure. how, do you, how do you approach conversations about this kind of stuff with exchanges? Like, is, I'm sh you know. What do you mean? They have all the... Stuff? But like transparency or they, I know they have all the power and you just have to sort of. Yeah. The reality is I don't, I yeah. don't, I, well, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily kiss their ass, but I don't have this conversation because what's the point? Yeah. If they yeah, wanted to yeah. do it. They would do it. Yeah. You know, and why do they not do it? Because they have an information advantage. Yeah. What's the benefit of having an information advantage It's profitable for them as a company. Are there exchanges that you, and you don't have to name names, but are there exchanges that you have avoided working with just because you know that they have sketchy shit going on? Yeah, there, there are some, yeah. But they're usually, they're usually uh, not top tier exchanges. Yeah. Um, they're usually kind of obscure exchanges mm -hmm. that are in weird jurisdictions. And if you look at their liquidity, it's just mostly wash trading and other, you know, nonsense. I, I stay away from them. Yeah. Um, you know, some, yeah, I don't have there, have there been a couple that, uh, you know, we've been offered to potentially partner with and I've looked into them and like, you know, I wouldn't put my tokens there. And so if, if people did and, and then, you know, who knows what could happen. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even, even when the top tier ones, are so uh, prone to sketchy shit. It's like, <laughs> well, really the, one thing they have, ones. they have, you know, leveraged products, right? Yeah. And that, that gets, that gets a little weird in terms of information asymmetry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, like that whole, I can't see inside of it. Right. I, I can certainly speculate as somebody with like common sense and logic. I can see the advantages they would have. And I would say, well, if I was in that position, would it be profitable for me to leverage that advantage to my favor? I think it's common sense. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's common sense, but, um, you know, in terms of, uh, exchanges, yeah, there are some good ones, but you know, the reality is for us, we're growing ecosystem. Uh, volume is going to be probably, it's always been our Achilles seal because we don't try to hack it. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're, when we're running minimal market making, um, you know, sometimes our uh, volume is, is volatile, right? We'll have days where it's like, you know, a couple hundred thousand and then days where it's multi-million, 15 million. And mm -hmm. a lot of that just has to do with the uh, sentiment and, uh, you know, kind of awareness more than anything. But I do think that as we develop as an ecosystem and as we build more utility, more use, um, you know, when we do get awareness, people are going to really pay attention. And I do hope that, uh, you know, as we kind of open our market access, um, you know, we do attract a lot of miners because that is uh, one thing that I think we have a huge, uh, just unique position in terms of DeFi. Uh, for a proof of work chain, um, there's really not much left after ETH left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from a ground up proof of work based EUTXO protocol, we're the only shining light there, aren't we? Um, pretty so much. <laughs> you know, they're pretty much. The, Yergo is a unique animal in this space. Um, and, and, and a lot of that probably uh, was born from the fact that Alex is a unique animal in this. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, I, I like being part of the project. I, I love being a part of it because I understand 
kind of the intent and I don't know, I see principles that I think are important. Yeah, that's one thing I hope that the uh, community don't lose also is that um, uh, the, that's so common mindset, I guess. Uh, I think at the moment we sort of, we still do attract the like-minded people who do have um, that sort of that first, first principle mindset and they're in here for the right reasons. They ask the right questions. They they want to drive privacy, for instance, or transparency and um, both from the development front, from the um, user front, so it's just a matter of sort of getting people out there, um, educating, and then anyone who does come into the ecosystem, just hopefully sort of educate them on on the right sort of questions to ask. Um, I think the KYA is huge in our ecosystem. It needs to be. I wish it were more common in crypto because it would, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure things would move and people would, you know, win, right? But a lot more people lose in that case where they move into the unknown and, uh, you just got to be careful out there. You got to know your assumptions because that's how you protect yourself. It's how you quantify risk. And ultimately, a... sorry, well, go ahead. I was just going to say, ultimately, these systems are designed from a first principles perspective that if you can understand the assumptions, you know whether or not the system is controlled or not. Yeah. What I was going to say then is um, uh, basically along the lines of um, liquidity and I think sort of the lack of liquidity from ergo on exchanges. Like if you look at the wallets, um, the exchange wallets themselves, they're upwards of two, three million sort of thing. But um, if you look at that in the whole scheme of things, that's just a drop in the ocean. I think there's, is it 10 or 15%, I think, of the circulating supplies um, on exchanges. So um, from that perspective, the KYI, KYA sort of side of it, the self-custody is kind of uh, um, keeping all of those coins, uh, people are help holding it in their own, um, own wallets, they're having custody of their own coins, but ultimately it's kind of somewhat detrimental in some respect about having the liquidity on, uh, on exchanges. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and <clears throat> that's kind of a balance that uh, we just need to be aware of. Now, one nice thing about proof of work, right, is ideally you have these miners with real world input costs. OK, and so some of them uh, simply by the nature of the beast will need to go to exchanges and liquidate and cover their costs. And, you know, those miners are the ideal liquidity provider because that pressure to exchanges is relatively constant, right? If you have yeah. someone that's uh, trying to cover their bills every month, so, uh, and usually they have a pretty regular liquidation schedule set up, um, you know, they are our market makers. That's uh, kind of the beauty of proof of work is you do have a certain uh, exchange pressure coming from them because they have real world costs to cover. So, but if you have a project where let's say you have a token and uh, you can stake the token and you can make more tokens, it changes the incentive to have a organic, uh, let's say liquidity flow. It just does, it's a different game. It's, it's different assumptions that uh, you need to make. Now, maybe there are people out there that, you know, they sell their staking rewards, right? I can see that as some, you know, form of like passive revenue or something. Uh, but you can't always make the assumption because if they save that, then they'll get a larger stake, you know, the next time. So the game theory there gets a little bit more. Yeah, they don't have the costs that they have to cover. Exactly, exactly. They're not, you know, they, there's no pressure for them to sell. It's just if they choose to or not, or they can stake right. and accumulate. And as they do that, they kind of grow it's hard to say um mm -hmm. so i do like proof of work in that sense where you have uh organic pressure that's uh coming from kind of the people that uh basically the tokens are emitted to and they also serve a really unique function where they inherit risk mm -hmm. right and and what does that do is uh, you know, it's both profitable 
and you know sometimes dangerous to be a big miner. Uh, it's certainly something that you know in a volatile market we've seen massive mining operations go uh, you know under. And uh, what does that do? It creates a zero rate of return on top of the chain with the asset. Yeah. And so then, then we can build on top of that um, asset that's backed by you know physical work and real world costs and create a zero market paradigm where if you could perform any positive return, there's an incentive for liquidity providers to use it because it outperforms holding a token that you know, stays just that token. Yep. Yeah, having that real world cost. Um, that's one thing that sort of I like about proof of work, to be honest, you did touch on it. Uh, the real world cost, the real world um, maintenance, the time that has to, people have to put in and to maintain these rigs and everything like that. Like there's a lot of things that have to happen to physically that have to go on. Um, on a proof of uh, stake sort of system, um, I for one can see basically um, just the compounding side of things coming into play where you basically want to have a large stake and then obviously just keep those compounding rewards keep coming in, which then grows your use it or your your base sell or your base um, collateral there because um, that's the name of the game. Try and build your stack and things like that, but you don't have to really necessarily be active in that front. Um, you can kind of just sit and forget and come back in a couple of years' time and um yeah see where you've sort of what you've accumulated well proof of yeah. work is taking electricity and input costs and basically storing it virtually and and you know even today you can say okay there's a certain um <clears throat> kilowatts that it takes to produce a bitcoin right and obviously that number is kind of changes over time and you have different uh, coins that have been on the market for different periods, but it does create some sort of base value proposition. That's quite interesting. All right, gents, we've been going now for upwards or close to an hour. Um, so we've been uh, hashing it out for a reasonable amount of time this week. I think we've got a little bit sort of carried away there at times, but it's been an interesting discussion once again because uh, crypto never ceases to amaze us what's going on here in the ecosystem currently. So uh, is there any what last words uh, for today's discussion? There's a reason why I keep beating the first principles drum over and over and over. <laughs> I really, you know, I, the reality is I have a full expectation that we'll have the same conversation, you know, maybe in a week, <laughs> maybe a month, maybe, you know, a couple of months, because the reality is that isn't sexy. Yeah. No, in terms of like marketability and, and you know, you, you see a lot of crazy stuff in this space, but um, try to boil it down to the first principles of why these systems exist. And, and that ultimately, I think, is what builds resiliency and, and value over time. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say, too. It's it's like the same shit we've been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks it's just another another day on this rock another, another one bites <laughs> the dust uh, maybe they haven't bit the dust but uh you know we already talked about that <laughs> yeah, you know his, history rhymes until people learn something yeah i mean i think yeah. that's true you know on a personal level i think that's true in terms of markets so it'll it'll probably rhyme for a bit but that's okay. I think that every time something like this happens, people do wake up a little bit. Yeah, it's just uh, it's one of those things that's about hardening uh, systems that we touched on earlier, but now it's hardening people's assumptions and uh, the industry as a whole and people getting um, wrecked on one hand. Hopefully it gets them in a better mindset and ask the right questions. And um, there's always going to be a speculative asset of uh, side to this industry, um, people jumping on, trying to make a quick buck, trying to get into um, a rich position from a fiat value. But obviously, we touched on um, 
jumping into Satoshis or nano ergs or whatever the other sort of side of things is because ultimately why these systems were created, it's counter economic tools and being able to sort of opt out of a traditional finance system. And I think um, that's one thing that I'm really looking forward to, whether it's in say five years, 10 years, or even 20, 30 years time. Um, that's that's what I'm here for. It's what I'm what I believe in. So it's just a matter of time to sort of seeing that out in my opinion. That's the fight. Yep. All right, gents, well, it's been a pleasure, like us, um, as every week is. Uh, I think we might have to replace the hide on that drum soon and um, give it a bit of a reaper because ultimately we're just going to keep banging it. So, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure discussing once again. Have a good one, everybody. Next time. Yep. Take care, guys. Have a good one.